Vic, I did want to go ahead and just start off by asking you to go ahead and just tell us a little bit about your background, if you wouldn't mind. Sure. I understand you have a pretty interesting background, so if you wouldn't mind doing that, please do it now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I started out, I won't go all the way back, but I grew up in a small, well, small town on an island in the northwest of the United States called Whidbey, W-H-I-D-B-E-Y. And my career started basically when I was hired by a company out in Boulder, Colorado to play video games for a living, which was pretty unusual for the mid-90s. There weren't a lot of us out there doing that. And basically I was hired as a ringer to go around the different conventions and make the software look better than it actually, well, to play it, I should say, as good as it could be played. How's that? Not better than it was, but it, make it above average. And that was kind of fun, did, you know, Mac Worlds and E3 and, and stuff like that. And then after that, I jumped over to some time and attendance software companies. And what I was doing there was teaching people proprietary software around the country, which was kind of fun. So I flew around to just about every town you would never want to go to on vacation in the United States and, and some outside the United States. And that's what I did for the better part of the next 15, pushing 20 years. And during that time, that's when I got into conspiracies. Well, I should say I got into conspiracies before I went to Colorado, you know, the, the early stuff, you know, JFK. I, I've, I'm old enough that I saw JFK in the theater in the early 90s and thought I had seen just about every conspiracy there was except for, of course, the most ridiculous of all conspiracies, which is Flat Earth. And that's how I kind of finally stumbled upon it. Now, so. what would you say, Mark, if you could say one thing to all of those people that, and I was in this camp at one point myself, admittedly, until I started to look into it, mm -hmm. and I, I probably had a similar experience, but what would you say to all of those out there that are just completely closed-minded about flat earth they think it's stupid they think it's ridiculous and they won't even take a second glance at it uh to them i would say and my answer is really kind of varies from from month to month but what i'm kind of leaning towards now is before you reject it entirely know this i was like you Meaning nobody in the Flat Earth community starts out thinking that Flat Earth is a great idea. In fact, it's the exact opposite. Everyone hates it. It is the worst, worst thing you could ever think of in terms of conspiracies. I've not, I'm not kidding when I said in the clues, I know guys that go to alien conventions and think that every member of the royal house or houses are reptilian. And yet, when you say, oh yeah, by the way, I've looked at this flat earth thing, they'll get the hell out of here and they'll wave you out of the room. So, but, but to, to people that don't know, you know, they're, they're looking at this going, okay, this guy is obviously insane. And I might be certifiable as far as you know. But I try to say this, okay, you, you know it's, it's a globe. You know this with every fiber of your being. How do you know this? And by that, I, and let me back up for a sec. The first picture that was officially taken of Earth in its entirety was in 1972 by Apollo 17. How did you know before that? Because you didn't have any pictures before 1972. Yeah, I know you can say, oh, there come some fuzzy pictures, you know, in the late 50s and early 60s. I'm like, fine. How did you know before NASA? Because it's not like we woke up one day in the 70s and just realized the Earth was a globe. We knew for at least, and I don't care if you want to go back to the Greeks or... or other civilizations you know they go way way back for at least 500 years before nasa uh, 450 years before nasa we knew this for an absolute fact how did you know and eventually the person on the other end and you know i'm, I'm playing both sides here is going to say something like well science told us that that is generally their answer and so i try to calmly say okay what exactly did science tell you to make you believe it was a globe. And it's not that science told you anything specific. That's that's where everyone gets tripped up. The thing is, if they tell you something for so long to where your father was told this and his father and his father going back at least 20 generations, 
you have no chance. So don't don't feel bad that, that you fell for this because this is something that goes back so far that it, go, it it's beyond most people's general family trees. This goes back before photography. This goes back before balloon travel. This goes back before a lot of things. So the fact that you you, you know you woke up one day or well, let's say you were born in I don't know 1980, uh, you, you were done. You you were going into a classroom where the globe was sitting there, and all you had to do was sit there and look at that stupid toy globe for the last you know if you went through just high school 12 years. That's it. That's that's classic conditioning to where it is so burned in your head you will brace against it you will defend against it and it's always interesting to see and i i can't get mad at people who just put up the, put up their fists and say you're an idiot you're a moron uh, i i i try to come back to them i go do you even know why you're upset at this point i could bring up this will this will kind of gives you again an idea of how strong the conditioning here is here i could bring up any other topic and you would not be as so violently opposed to it and i mean take your pick uh abortion rights uh gay rights women's rights black rights stem cell research just go on and on and on right it, it makes no difference you are not going to break why does this why do you brace against this more than you do those other very very uh highly polarizing topics it's because you were born into it it's the only thing we debunk to children so sorry i'm i'm rambling no, that's that's very interesting, and and for people that actually get into the subject matter, what path what what pathway do they usually take? How do they find out that the Earth might actually be flat? Um, lately, it's been because YouTube has recommended it to them, which is interesting in itself. Meaning that I've YouTube has in, implemented two different things over the years. One has been the recommendations, you know, which shows up on the right hand bar, and the other thing is autoplay. That has really taken a lot of people. Meaning, when you're playing a video and the video stops, usually the video would just stop, but now autoplay rolls into a video that YouTube will choose for you. And I cannot tell you the amount of phone calls and emails I've gotten from people that have said, "Oh yeah, I was watching a JFK video." and all of a sudden a flat earth thing followed it or I mean, even remotely conspiracy it just keeps getting recommended to them and then once they start down that road you know once they start going down that that rabbit hole well it's it's a deep one and they're they're not coming out of it anytime soon yeah i had that experience myself i must have spent uh, 20 to 40 hours or more just sitting on my computer all night long watching flat earth videos yeah, oh yeah, people will lose. I also get, I, I don't get that much crap for it, but people lose a lot of sleep because there's so much content out there where to where I'm kind of envious in a way of people that are just getting into it now because when you when you get into it now, it's not like you know, a couple of years ago when, when it took a while and you were waiting for new videos to come out. There is such a huge back catalog of flat earth videos that you could be watching eight hours a day for months and never never get through uh, the the never even come close to getting through the amount of videos there's, there's tons and tons i mean i alone me myself right now have i think 650 videos on my channel and i just keep cranking them out so yeah it's a lot of fun now, one thing that was disturbing for me when I went through the process, if you want to call it that, mm -hmm. of, of staying up all night and watching these videos and having that whole mind screw process <laughs> taking part in my brain, uh, one of the things that really bothered me and screwed with me the most were these videos that were pointing out how fake space actually looked. If you look at the details of the videos that are taken in space, whether they're from NASA or from China or from Russia, yeah. they all seem to be completely fake. They don't I mean if you really look closely, they don't even really look real at all. Yeah, what? they you're absolutely right. And they the the fakeness started of course NASA NASA was built and and for people again who are listening to this first time, I'm not just saying that some of NASA is faked. I'm including the moon mission and uh, the ISS and Soyuz and everything else you can think of. I'm saying that NASA the only reason NASA was formed in the first place was to keep this thing a secret. And what they did was kind of clever. They used a combination of 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 milking 
a very very small amount of photos and videos for you know as I mean playing those records for as long as you possibly could and then letting science fiction and the Hollywood and Hollywood without any help from them uh, just kind of fill in the gaps so when again if you're going down this road and you want to try to disprove this because everyone's going to try or say well i can totally disprove flat earth it's stupid i'm just going to look up some nasa stuff and i'll be able to solve it in a couple days and that's exactly what i did and that's what a lot of people do but when you look at nasa and if you want to look at jaxa or the european agency or those others that's fine too but if you're looking at them you start to see that all the, the you there should be tons and tons and tons of films and uh, short little videos and documentaries and still shots there should be tons and tons and tons of them in fact you, you assume this it, that there should be an entire warehouse full of boxes full of evidence that should be able to squash the flat earth but as you're going through those boxes you realize they're all empty there's nothing there uh to where you know i commented i wasn't the one to first discover this it's don't in fact don't when you're when you're examining nasa it's not what to look for it's what not to look for what's missing so for example there is no footage of any astronaut in, in an exterior shot not interior but exterior shot of any space mission where they pan the camera around 180 degrees or further statistically that's bordering on impossible you know the, on the moon what nobody took a camera and just spun around uh or even the iss even today it's 2017 nobody's in the iss walk outside the capsule and just spin around with a the camera they, they won't do it um there's no footage of any rocket from you know from the rocket's point of view with a camera on the rocket of any rocket leaving the earth's orbit or returning to earth without that's unedited unedited i mean just let the film run and you know rockets move pretty fast you'd think you know the, the very least leaving earth you'd be able to get some shots there no the 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 camera for whatever reason always drops off during the first or second stage which is fascinating um there's no movies of even an astronaut with uh, opening up an airlock and walking outside of it there's so many things that should be there uh, no no videos in fact we've got a, a, a wonderful little short vid on my channel where uh, one of the community members called up the NASA trademark office. And these are the guys that you call up if you want to, if you're a Hollywood producer looking for stuff. And he pretended to be a Hollywood producer, fairly convincing, I might add. And he filmed himself talking to, the, to this guy on speakerphone. And he was looking for the Earth rotating on its axis, authentic Earth rotating on its axis from space. Didn't exist. Now, all this changed in the summer of 2015 where all of a sudden nasa released some some things it's like oh no no here's the earth rotating on its axis from space and here's the moon transiting in front of it it's like okay um where'd this set where'd this satellite come from it just announced it out of nowhere and when they did that you notice that the weather wasn't morphing during that shot and of course the moon was completely wrong the perspective was completely wrong for the moon transiting in front and then right after that they announced a japanese satellite so oh yeah here's here's a here's a shot of the the earth um with the weather morphing but it isn't spinning so you can do one or the other apparently but not both and that those just came online in in 2015 or the middle of 2015 so what i try to tell people is you know if they show me this i'm going hey those didn't even come online until we asked for them we're talking 40 something years of, of, of nobody's ever come up with this i call it the angry wife syndrome where uh, the husband comes home after 40 years of marriage and the wife says well i'm gonna i'm gonna divorce you and he goes why she goes because in all the years i've been married to you, you've only bought me one bouquet of flowers so what do you think happens the next day he comes home and he's going hey i got a bouquet of flowers you don't have to get divorced anymore and she looks at him and says what are you talking about the only reason you've been bought the damn flowers is because i told you that's really what what they've been pushing lately but even the stuff they've been pushing lately is horrible so and why do you what are your beliefs regarding i mean if you have them regarding why we're not able to get up into space is there really a dome of some type covering the earth i believe there is yes uh and, it, and some of it goes into the biblical thing but i'm not going to quote chapter and verse here uh the firmament is otherwise as it's known but i call it you know the truman show dome a terrarium dome a planetarium a ant farm whatever you want to call it it could be there for <coughs> excuse me one of two reasons 
one uh, that we uh, we're trying to be protected from something that's on the outside of us, or two, because they're trying to keep us from getting out. One of the one of the two, because we you know we're a very dangerous savage species and we've all seen the the hollywood movies over the last 50 60 years you know even what was that movie uh, uh the day the earth stood still the original one not the keanu reeves one where and that was back in the early days of science fiction where they said look you humanity is not going to be allowed to just start roaming through the galaxy now do i even think there's a galaxy outside of this doesn't have to be it doesn't have to be at all so yeah i do believe in a firmament i do believe in a dome i do believe that you cannot get high enough to even take a picture of uh, even an accurate flat earth picture which is why all the nasa rockets arc over into almost a near horizontal uh, trajectory immediately after takeoff they should go straight up for a long long time and they don't you can watch the time lapse footage or even the time lapse still photography of nasa rockets they always arc over they, you know, we they should be heading you know, damn near straight up and they don't so no no i don't think we can get high enough and now does that mean there's nothing up there no 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 and people say oh no i've seen satellites and i've seen the iss it's like okay you've seen something up there but there's no people on it i fine you want to claim that the iss is up there fine there's nobody living on there if you think i'm kidding look at the iss interior footage and to throw one more thing in there if you want to have some fun because this was recommended to me by a british guy years ago before i was into flat earth he goes get a pair of night vision binoculars and start looking at the sky at night wait till your eyes get adjusted and start looking at the sky and tell me what you see there's a lot of stuff flying up there and it doesn't isn't us it isn't satellites i don't know what they are but uh it's not the americans i can tell you that much oh wow so you're telling me if i go out and buy some night vision goggles and wait for my eyes to adjust and look at the sky i'm going to observe some phenomena oh yeah the sky's crawling with things i used to go out almost every clear night in colorado and colorado was great because it was high altitude and so you didn't have to deal i mean the atmosphere was was thinner and i remember the first night i went out there because again the conditioning i was going wow there's a lot of satellites up there i mean it's it's you 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 night not just night vision goggles but night vision binoculars that you can get them on amazon uh i recommend because i went through a, a lot of different pairs uh night owl in 5x don't get anything less than 5x i mean if you got a couple grand to spend then yeah you can get a 10x but for like 500 bucks you can get a, a decent 5x and what you see is a lot of objects that you cannot see with the naked eye and it's not because of the magnification it's because of the the low light they're, they're not reflecting anything and, and everybody please donate to end of days radio so i can afford a pair of those <laughs> there you go oh it's, it's totally worth it absolutely worth your time and when I, the first night because it only took two nights to figure this out the first night i'm going there are a lot of satellites up there I mean, a ton of satellites up there, and they're, some are flying in formation, and some are, uh, they're going in all different directions, and it's like weird, you know, it's like, how could, you know, how could I not see these? And then the second night, I'm getting bored, because like, oh, I don't want to look at satellites all day, and I'm watching one, I'm watching one, and then all of a sudden it slows down, and it stops, like it's lost or something. And then after apparently it got directions, it made a right hand turn, sped up, went ballistic and was out of sight in, I don't know, 15 seconds. And I, you know, you're sitting there going, okay, what, what was I just looking at exactly? And then you have to put into object, you have to put into question everything else that's flying up there. And then you wait long enough, you wait a few days or a week and you'll see your first formation. You see your first squadron you know, the flying in a V formation and, you know, up to, you know, as small, as little as three or four and as many as 12 to 15. And it's incredible to see, you know, people say, oh, yeah. no, I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, actually, I was just going to mention that I had an experience like that. I did not have the night vision goggles, but I was looking up at the sky and I saw a bunch of satellites and there was way too many of them there was probably a total of seven yeah. or eight of them flying in different directions and, yeah. and blinking shining they would all of a sudden shine brighter than they should be like more to the extent than it would be if it was just reflecting sunlight oh yeah that, yeah one of my ufo sightings 
Oh yeah, yeah, that's absolutely true. There's the sky's crawling with that stuff. In fact, it's it's interesting because when I was watching it, it the um, in fact they just celebrated the I think it was the 70th anniversary of the Kenneth Arnold sighting, the guy that actually coined flying saucers up here in Washington State. And remember, he was flying. It was daytime, and he was flying above them in a Cessna, and they were hugging the tree line below him, which was even even better. But what you're seeing, I, I, what I called them after a while as I was watching it was I called them driver's ed because that's what they reminded me of. They were always during a certain time of an evening, like after school, but before you went home. And it was a certain number. It wasn't an excessive amount. It wasn't like an armada of 20 or something like that. But that's but they all felt like they were tethered together, like they were like they were training, like they were just going trying to figure out how to drive these things. And it was impressive. It was, and once you see it, I mean, they don't make any sound, and you know, they they're not birds flapping around or anything. I know what a bird looks like, and, and a bird can't cross a horizon in that short amount of time uh, at that altitude. And it was amazing. It was, so anyway, the point is, there's a lot of stuff up there, and it is not us. Okay, and a lot of people, including me, one of the things that they are most curious about regarding flat Earth theory is the edge what's on the edge is it an ice wall well that's just it in fact there's been a lot of confusion about that since the the new wave of flat earth community has has emerged which is people keep thinking that the edge of this you know it's like a game of thrones ice wall at the end and that's only partially true meaning the coastline of antarctica and you guys can look this up the the actual physical coastline of antarctica not the peninsula not the islands but hardcore main body of antarctica is a giant wall of ice that just extends from from the ocean straight up on 150 200 feet depending on where you are and then the antarctica as a continent is really unique because then it goes in let's say you 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 were in a boat and you got to the edge of the antarctic and you climbed up on top of it well as you're moving inland, it slopes up really, really quickly to where most of the continent, at least the ones they're announcing to us, is at least 12,000 feet in altitude. And that's really, really high. You know, altitude sickness starts kicking in with some people at about 7,000 feet. 12,000 feet, most people are going to feel really, really lightheaded. And then what I believe is that it just keeps going in. Uh, for several thousand miles so it's not the edge by any stretch the coastline is just the beginning of the edge and then it goes in i don't know let's say several thousand miles i think it's far enough that it took them almost 30 years with planes to figure out where the edge was remember that admiral bird was looking literally in his and he flew his own stuff he was looking from 1928 until 1956 and that's when that's when he quit his last mission was 1955 56 with operation deep freeze so it's deep enough the edge is thick enough that so you've got where the water meets you know with rubber meets the road you where the water meets the ice and the distance between where the ice starts and what i call the outer marker or the outer barrier or you want to call it the wall of the dome the truman show wall that's got to be another several thousand miles at least and it's pure, you know, it's pure snow and ice. It, it is tough sledding. No pun intended there. Could there be land beyond the poles? Like it says in that famous book, could there be other civilizations and even other tribes of humans out there? Oh, sure. Why not? You know, if this place isn't a one-off, and I'm so fond of saying that, you know, we're not the first civilization to rent this apartment by any stretch. This is where we are. If this is a giant terrarium, this is, wasn't built just for us. As, as special as we are, there were other civilizations before us. And there's evidence of it still lying around. The, the sunken cities off of Japan, the sunken cities off of India, the Bosnian pyramids, uh, Bimini Road, the Bermuda Triangle. All these things are just leftover ruins of, of, of the groups that were here before. We might be the seventh group, the eighth group. We might be the 20th group. Uh, who, who, you know, more interesting when you work your way backwards, though, because then you're talking about when the continents were just one big giant continent called Pangea, and, you know, were the sun and the moon even in the sky at that point. It gets really, really interesting. But other civilizations outside of here, sure, sure. I mean, there could be other worlds. I mean, other other dome-like structures outside just like ours or in different states of uh, technological evolution. How about 
stars uh we look up in the sky and we see twinkling lights and we assume that they're luminous light bodies that are out there burning right. are are stars actually stars or are they something else oh no no i think they're just lights i i think they're literally no different than when you go into a planetarium you, and I know it kind of dates me when I say that. A planetarium, for those of you who don't know, is a building you go into and it simulates the sky, most often used at night. And it basically it's a display system projected onto uh, the ceiling of a domed structure from the inside. So in a case like this, I mean, we could build them to where the, the display system was on the outside or the projectors were on the outside if you really wanted to. But yes, the stars are not these burning, huge burning balls of gas that are millions of light years away, potentially. They're just little lights in the sky that are built into either the dome structure or just outside of it. And uh, not to quote uh, any chapter and verse on this one, but yeah, you say, let's say God made the, uh, the sun and the moon, which we'll get to. Uh, it was NASA that told you how far they were away and how big they were. One thing that always did bother me about NASA, well, I can't say that it always bothered me because before when I heard it, I didn't even think about it for one second. But one thing that bothers me about them now is they tell you all these crazy flight paths that these probes are taking where they shoot them off into the deep of space and then they, they orbit a planet and then they slingshot off and then they go orbit another planet and they oh, yeah. do all kinds of things that just seem ridiculous. It, it seems like we shouldn't even have the technology yet that would allow a probe to do that. And then mm -hmm. when they show pictures of them, they look, they look like toys. Yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right. And what... In fact, it gets even weirder because only recently have we been showing more 3D models. It's not just that the Earth is spinning on its axis and rotating around the sun at, let's say, 60,000 miles an hour, if you believe mainstream science. The solar system is flying sideways like a shotgun pattern at about half a million miles an hour. So one of my questions is, okay... You know, there's there's a lot of distance between, let's say, the Earth and Mars and Mars and Jupiter. There's a lot of null points where gravity is kind of off, you know, it's on its own, right? So how exactly is a probe that's being fired off towards Jupiter not being left in the dust by our own solar system? Then you can say, oh, no, our solar system drags it because of gravity. I'm going, well, not entirely it wouldn't. You know, you throw a golf ball out, out outside the window of a car. Yeah, it's going to keep up with a car for a little while because of momentum. And if you want to say the gravity is going to pull a little bit, yeah, it might be able to keep it a little bit longer. But sooner or later, that probe is going to be left. It's going to be left behind. You're, you're not going to catch it, which, of course, leads into a question that one of my uh, uh, friends said. He goes, how exactly does Halley's Comet come back? Because Halley's Comet, you know, supposedly circles, it does this elliptical orbit around our solar system every 76 years, but it leaves the solar system. So if the solar system is flying away from it, how exactly does that comet get pulled back into our solar system so much, with so much force that it actually catches up and goes fast? Remember, because it's got to go faster than our solar system to catch up to the sun, then loop around the sun and go back. What is pulling it back? At that point, I know everyone's going, oh, gravity, gravity. It's like, no, you can't use gravity for everything. And we're slowly but surely making gravity a, a, a tough foundation to stand on. And then there's other videos that show some of the obvious fakery, some of the stage magic that they're using in some of these ISS videos. One thing that really got me laughing pretty hard were these ridiculous hairstyles that some of the women had up on the International Space Station. Yeah. Uh, they actually put hairspray in their hair to make, make it almost seem like a lack of gravity is having an effect on their hair. It's making it stand up, when in but, reality, go ahead. Yeah, but it wasn't just because of that. It was because, the reason why they did it that way, well, okay, what, I, I have some criticisms you probably heard me say on other things, which is, if you're going to simulate zero G, problem with with women's hair is that women's hair is like <clears throat> it reacts to any sort of movement like they're like you're in a swimming pool and you know so if a woman's hair moves one way you know a head moves one way the hair is going to kind of trail behind like a like a kite tail and you can't let that happen if you're using zero g planes 
because it will give it away. It'll, you know, it's like, wait, why is all this motion? Why is that woman's hair moving around so much? So instead of doing the three first logical things I would come up with, one is, I don't know, have wear really, really short hair because you shouldn't have long hair at all on the space station anyway. Two, tie it back in a rubber band. Those don't cost a lot of money. Or three, spend a few bucks and actually put a NASA hat on or use any corporate logo and, and you know endorse the sucker. But no, what they did was they hairsprayed the, the woman's hair into place kind of straight up like the Bride of Frankenstein. And it didn't, it to where it was stiff. I mean, you could throw a ball off of it and it'd probably bounce off. So what, how, why, why would they do that? The, the reason was, again, because they had to, you have to appeal to the lowest common denominator. And at the same time, you want to make sure that you, you know, their, their hair doesn't bounce around. So I think they got greedy, really, you know, which is fine you could have put him in a hat and no one would have known any different but the average knuckle dragger at home is like oh their hair's up it's because zero gravity you know they they just don't they just don't the, don't know the difference uh, unfortunately all the nerds out there in the internet world and there's a lot more of them every single year figured that one out pretty quick but that's just they've they've been making mistakes for years the, the one i loved recently was the uh, the 1983 footage that we just dug up recently which was the uh uh, one when they were they were blasting off, that you you looked at them managing the control panels, and they not only did they not were they not wearing gloves, they weren't even wearing sleeves, and two they were wearing motorcycle helmets. But it's like, okay, why are you wearing a pressurized helmet if your arms and hands are exposed, and I can see your neck, so that helmet isn't actually attached to anything. You're not even wearing a freaking spacesuit. Why are you wearing the helmet at all? It's not like you're on a, a, a mountain bike. This is back in the 80s. And then, you know, when they were showing the model, I don't know if you saw that one, where they were showing the back payload of the of the space shuttle. And it, and all of a sudden you see this giant head behind it. Some guy who was working the model couldn't get out of the frame fast enough. And that, that was just in the 80s. They've Everyone makes production mistakes because live is a lot different than movies. Live, there's a reason why you don't see a lot of live television. And that's because people make mistakes and they're, they're getting called out on it. Yeah, I mean, back to the hair thing, just real quick. Mm -hmm. What's funny is that if, if there really was no gravity, to see what that would look like, all you'd have to do is watch a video of a woman with long hair swimming underwater. That's exactly how it should look, not oh, yeah. stiff and weird like it does. Oh, no, there's, there's women on zero-G planes. I don't think they really sell those tours anymore where you can see you know all you have to type in, in zero g plane footage where yeah women with with longer hair that yeah it just flows it flows like you're in water and that's exactly what it should be because remember we're not the air that we breathe is all is really just a thin version of water if water is two parts hydrogen one part oxygen remember the air we breathe is one part oxygen four parts nitrogen it's still kind of a soupy mixture. Yeah, it's thinner than water, but it's not a vacuum by any stretch. So women's hair is going to float in it. Another thing that I find to be hilarious is this 24-7 streaming video that supposedly comes from the ISS. Yep. I find it hilarious because uh, the nighttime footage especially, it just looks so god-awful fake. It's so oh, obviously yeah. CGI. I mean, it has that cartoonish kind of look that cgi has it, it i don't know why anybody would even buy into that being real oh I, I can go one step further there you guys want to have some fun forget about the blue marble shots look up something called the black marble shots which is basically the earth taken at night from supposed you know satellites composites and it took the nerd squad almost no time to figure this one out, which was when you're looking at the black marble shots, you look at the whole earth and, and they, they kind of, you know, do a Mercator map spread out of the whole thing. You're looking at Western Australia and it's lit up with all these massive population centers. Well, there are no population centers in Western Australia. Australia is basically a, a desert continent where everyone lives on the coastline. And yet there were these huge swaths of lights that especially if there was one section that looked like a major metropolitan city it was in the middle of a national park and when they approached nasa with this and you know nasa took all the shots and said hey where are all these lights and they they said oh um those are brush fires yeah there were a lot of brush fires that summer i'm going really brush fires 
across this big area that look exactly like the cities that were next to them, brush fires, those brush fires. And if you knew there were brush fire, you, you didn't edit them out. It was just ridiculous. And again, it was just laziness on their part. People that do graphic design, computer people, no offense, I'm one of them, you tend to fall into patterns and you tend to get lazy. No different than um, Scott Simmons, the guy that came up with the first blue marble shot for the iPhone. <clears throat> Remember back in when the first iPhone came out, what was that, 2004, 2005, something like that? There were no pictures of the Earth from space. No new ones, kind of like when I was looking back in 2000. And so he was a NASA consultant and had to create a blue marble Earth shot from scratch. And when he did it, he photoshopped the hell out of it. And he used the cloning tool when he got lazy with the cloud formations in the Southern Hemisphere. And there's tons of duplicate cloud, I mean, identical cloud, you know, it was obvious the cloning tool that was used. And he was on an audio interview with the, the famous quote where he's saying, yeah, it's Photoshop, but it has to be. Because there was, he had to create something from scratch because there were no photos of the Earth from space in 2004, which should be impossible, but that's true. I also, I also saw this other video. I found this humorous as well. Apparently, there's a satellite up there that that was launched originally in the 1960s, and there's supposedly people in Antarctica getting internet through that satellite right now. Really, internet through a 60s satellite? Yeah. For, Forty years before the internet was was fully up and running. Uh huh. Yeah. I, 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 I highly, what, what's the baud rate on that? Come on. I, I mean, I, it was, I was still using a 33, six modem in the early two thousands. So don't, don't tell me there's a 60 satellite can do that. No, there's no, there's no, there's nothing up there. There never was. I mean, if there is anything up there, it's being suspended by something, whether it's a uh, part of the NASA balloon project, but there's nothing. It's not what you think it is up there. There's, there's no, you don't need satellites for communications. And by that, look up the, the clue I did on how GPS satellites, you know, the Department of Defense, United States, 32 satellite system, blanket coverage that's supposed to be tracking every object that's flying in the world. And yet when any plane leaves any coastline where it's at least 150 miles away from any other body, you know, like an island or anything like that, the GPS drops off. It doesn't exist, which is coincidentally enough, the limit of ground-based radar. So how does that work? How does your plane? Oh yeah, you can still see it on the screen. It's still there, but if you click on it, the latitude and longitude completely vanishes. It goes into approximated mode or estimated mode, which means they have no idea where your plane is. Is it, speaking of Antarctica, is it true that nobody's actually allowed to travel there? It's not that you can't travel there. So if you, for example, wanted to go to Antarctica tomorrow, you could pay the ten, fifteen thousand dollars and you could travel to you get a trip and you could go to the peninsula somewhere and have your picture taken with penguins next to some island. You know, that'd be really fun. But when it comes what what's really interesting isn't the individual. So yeah, you could you can go down there for a limited time. But if you had, let's say, have a company, be it an oil company or a gas company or a mining company or what, uranium or whatever it is, you aren't allowed to go there ever for any amount of money. I don't care what lobbyist you use, how much money you spend on bribes, how many palms you grease, you cannot go down there. And, and this applies to every country. The, the 1959 Antarctic Treaty is the longest running most universal treaty that we have no country has broken it no country has even tried to break it no country has even protested against this and we're talking countries that could use the resources we're talking heavy hitters like like russia after world war ii the united kingdom after world war ii china lord knows they need resources all the time you cannot go down there so I mean, you're thinking okay what does that mean i'm saying that it's the only conspiracy one of a uh, just a small, small handful of conspiracies that's bigger than money. Meaning, if I own Exxon Mobil, here's where it gets weird. I own Exxon Mobil, and I want to go down to Antarctica. I can't do it. 
the treaty forbids me to do it. And even if I could grease the palms of one country, it's set up to where multiple countries have to approve me to, to do it, which is amazing. Every real piece of real estate in the world is owned by somebody except for Antarctica. The entire continent is not owned by anybody and it's protected by everybody for some mysterious reason. But not only is my company not allowed to go down there, but I am not even allowed to talk about it. So you think, well, you know, I get a wild hair at my ass. Like, you know what? I'm going to go to the New York Times. I got a couple friends there. I'm going to have them run a full page ad and tell people why it's great for Mark's con con uh, company to go down to Antarctica. No, I'm not even allowed to do that for some reason. It's not even something that can be brought up. You find me a congressman or a senator, or anybody that talks about this. Even though you're saying, well, there's nothing down there. I go, no, 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 no. Admiral Byrd, you know, the world's greatest explorer, he can, came on national television and he told everybody. He said, no, the place is made out of money. There's an entire mountain range made out of coal. There's oil. There's uranium. There's minerals. There's no indigenous plant life to step on. There's no uh, animal life anywhere around to, to, to accidentally run over. The place is literally made for resources. And yet, within a few years after he said that, the place was locked down tighter than a drum. Antarctica is one of the biggest red flags there is. It's the hidden... Most people don't even know that the Antarctic Treaty exists. You look it up online. This is not secret information. The Antarctic Treaty has layers and layers and layers of protection. It should have been broken by now. Or at the very least, it should have been contested by now. And yet every country... I, you Tell me something that unilaterally everybody agrees on. It doesn't exist. We, we, we make treaties to break them. This treaty is bulletproof. It's and it's not even literally up for debate for the next what is it 2017 till 2041. And it's it's amazing. So one sorry. thing always bothered me about Antarctica like when I was a little kid looking at globes mm -hmm. of course it didn't lead me to thinking the earth was flat or anything like that but I would always think why is the south pole why is Antarctica so huge yet the north pole is just like this tiny little thing. I always thought that looked a little bit off interesting isn't it the, the the south pole of this massive continent of antarctica is so it is it is the most unique continent of all the continents it doesn't make any sense it's just nothing but ice and snow it's very very tall it's taller than all the other continents combined in terms of, of overall uh, average altitude and support and we won't let planes fly over it as well we you know we people can fly around the world all day long going following the equator route but north to south they won't let you fly over there and when it's a short route like so you're fly, flying from the uh, southern part of um, africa to another southern hemisphere they will not let you fly over they banned that in the 1970s to where and they say oh no it's too cold going too cold you fly next to the north pole all the time what's what's too cold about antarctica they just make up stuff as it suits them and it's it's brilliant does anybody actually live there if, if i was to say try to go there organize some kind of party or something like that are they going to shoot me they you don't they don't have to shoot you you'll be you'll be so bogged down in red tape that you won't even get close to the place so I mean, people have talked about this already it's like we gotta get a plane gotta get somebody in a learjet and just just floor it and, you know and just head down there it's like well okay First, if you're going to try to do it through legal channels, you're going to have to have permission from a whole bunch of countries. And they're going to ask you what's about. And if you even hint to them what you're talking about, they're not going to let you anywhere near it. Two, if you decide to just go for broke and you have a pilot that's dying and he says, well, before I die, I'm going to fly this sucker all the way to the edge. No, that's fine. But remember the GPS system, that's the United States DOD, you're going to have to follow those coordinates. He's going to have to ignore his instruments at some point. And then you're going to have to be looking for ground markers, you know, reference, reference points. And they're not going to be there. So how exactly are you going to navigate towards the edge, even if you do? Again, remember, don't think this hasn't been tried. The United States government, uh, granted, the planes weren't that great in the 40s and 50s, but they were a lot better than they were in the 20s. They were looking for the edge for 30 years with a plane, with planes. And they still couldn't find it. So if you think you can just take a Learjet there and on your first shot, figure out where this thing is and then what, make it back to tell the tale? No. No, it's not going to happen. Antarctic trip is fraught 
with hurdles that are, are so big, you're, you're better off looking in other places to see, you know, to reveal this thing. Is it true that all flight paths are actually based on a flat earth? Yeah. Yeah, they are. Uh, flight paths, and that was one of the things that got me started on the whole flat earth thing, which was I watched a video where a German guy was saying that the flight paths in the southern hemisphere don't make any damn sense. Meaning, if you try to book something from anywhere in the southern hemisphere, like South America to Africa or Africa to Australia, or any has to be, everything's below the equator, below the equator to a below the equator. What happens is, is that you can't find non-stops. I had to revise my original clue because I couldn't find any. And then a couple weeks later after I put, put or a couple days later after I put the clue out, people were saying, no, we found a few. And it didn't bother 95% of the flights in the Southern Hemisphere, when you're cross the long distance flights, are multiple connections. And all the connections are going north, which is a weird, which is weird. So if I'm going from South America to Australia, right? Why am I going through Los Angeles or Dallas or San Francisco? And, and you start, when you start looking at these connections, get out a flat map and then plot the course from the south you know, to, from, for those destinations. And when you plot them on a flat map, they turn from these huge arcing curves and V's to a shallow dog leg. And in some cases, an exact straight line. And it only works on a flat map. It's brilliant. And that's one of the ways they've covered things up. I mean, one of the people I interviewed was a travel agent, corporate travel agent that specialized in Southern Hemisphere. And she had people complaining to her the entire time she was working there all the time that they couldn't get freaking nonstop flights in the Southern Hemisphere. I mean, no how, matter how much money you paid, you could not get them, you know, from certain cities. Yeah, fine. You want to go from what? Auckland, New Zealand to Santiago, Chile. You might have one, but there are certain cities. There are none at all. And we know that, you know, I know we're spoiled up in the United States in the Northern Hemisphere, but we can get nonstops all day long, especially if you got the money to pay for it. Down there, money has makes no difference. You can't get the nonstops for a most of the cities and it's fascinating one thing that struck a chord with me early on were some of these pictures that they were showing of the sun mm -hmm. and the way that it was spreading light onto the clouds right. it's it seems that if the earth really was round in a certain distance from the sun then the light should hit the earth evenly it shouldn't shine rays onto a small section of clouds like you'll often see on a semi-sunny day right the corpuscular ray argument and mainstream science will come back and, and say this they'll say well that's to be expected even though the sun is hundreds of thousands of miles wide and 93 million miles away but even mainstream science will come back to you and admit that well yeah, but it'll also do that if the sun is much closer and much smaller. And by that, I mean, say, 3,000 miles away and only 50 miles wide. You're saying, whoa, whoa, whoa. You know, I was with you up until that point, but that's ridiculous. It can't be that small. You don't think it's that small? Take a, a couple sticks and, you know, or, or popsicle sticks or whatever. Make, you know, some, some uh, things in the ground to where you have sticks like a sundial pointing straight up. And then take a flashlight and move it around. That flashlight is tiny compared to the sun. The sun should be this massive, massive, massive body, but it works also the same way if the sun is close. And uh, it's it's interesting. The corpuscular way, rays argument, while I don't think it's a silver bullet, it gives people a nice visual because it does make it appear that the sun is much, much closer. And why wouldn't it be? Uh, if we believe the illusion, uh, it, it's it's been working and you know nobody's nobody's detected it because mainstream science says oh no we're in this vast vast solar system do you have any theories on what the sun and moon might actually be or where they came from i think they were added in later versions i can say that much because the there's myths and legends going back at the with the moon at the very least because there's there's all sorts of fun stories where the moon was never there you know, there was just the sun. If you want to go back to, you know, I won't quote too much biblical stuff here, to where even the sun wasn't there. It was just shades of light and dark. Sort of like what we've done in games now. What the sun and the moon are, to me, the sun is just a giant heat lamp. That probably directional, like a spotlight. You know, like a directional heat lamp, like you'd find in a, a hotel bathroom. Or 
And the moon is the exact opposite, meaning it is a refrigerant light. And people are going, I've never heard of that term before in my life. I'm going, you don't, neither did I until about a year and a half ago. Where, and, and I remember when I first heard this test, and I, and I go, this can't be true, where the moon generates a cold light. And they go, no, 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 what do you mean? The, the moon, we all know them. it's colder at night. I go, no, 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 no. So it's, so let's say it's 90 degrees in the sunlight. You know, we all know that's about 80 degrees in the shade, maybe a little less because the, the, the shade deflects some of the sun's rays. Well, when you're in the moonlight, let's say it's 50 degrees in the moonlight, it's actually warmer in the moon shade. It's 60 degrees in the moon shade, and that should not be possible. And I'm not talking about residual heat left over from the sun. I'm saying that the moon is actually generating a cold light up to 13 degrees in some cases, from the moon shade. It's actually warmer in the moon shade. That should not be possible if the moon is reflecting the sun's rays. The moon is generating its own light. It's, it's self-luminescent. It's its own light source. And I will take credit for being the first one to ask, because it just occurred to me, where, okay, you take a magnifying glass of the sunlight and you can burn paper. We've all done it as kids. But what happens if you take a magnifying glass to this moonlight? What happens then? Does it get warmer or does it get colder? Turns out it actually gets colder. If you magnify moonlight, it, it's even colder than the moonlight itself. That's impossible. But we can do this in a university now, only I, I don't know, 10 years ago, maybe? It's called a cold laser. We can generate laser beams that can generate a cold light. And you're saying, well, okay, what's that mean? I'm going, okay, why is the moon generating a cold light? It should not be though. Now, does that prove a flat earth? No, no, it doesn't but it completely puts into question the relationship of the sun and the moon as we know it. A another interesting thing about that is the eclipse. It seems that eclipses line up just a little bit too perfectly. The, the distance between the planetary bodies would have to be perfect to achieve that. Yeah, the, the solar system coincidences are fun. And the two big ones that we notice are uh, how the moon fits perfectly in front of the sun during an eclipse. And they'll say, well, you know, the moon is 400 times more narrow than the sun, but the sun is also 400 times farther away. I go, wow, that matches up really, really well. Good, you know, good thing that worked out. But for me, the, even the bigger one is that the moon, we only see the exact same side of the moon. It never changes. Meaning when the moon rotates around the earth, it's also tracking with the earth to where it's perfectly aligned, to where we only see exactly, and I can't overstate this, exactly the same side of the moon. Meaning it doesn't even change a quarter of a degree every year. It, you could go 100 years, 1,000 years, we're only going to see the same side of the moon. That's amazing. That, that's uh, from, a, from a physics standpoint, that's, that's pretty incredible that it's locked in like that. But I don't think it's an accident. I just think it's part of the system that was designed. Could the moon be flat like the Earth? Could be. Could be. Sure, there's some people that said it's part of the display system. Could be. I Could be a three-dimensional object as well. I. It's hard to say. I mean, I've seen some really weird photos out there. Uh, you got to remember, if it is part of a projection system, they could be using technology that's well, far, far above ours. So if they're using some sort of holograph, you know, to, to deal with it, I'm, I'm not going to lose any sleep over it, let's put it that way. Whether it's 2D or 3D, either way, you're not landing anything on it. Now, if the Earth is flat or is some type of enclosure, why is it that when we dig deep into the ground, it gets hotter and hotter? Good point. In fact, that was one of my the, the clues that didn't get as, uh, as warm as a reception, no play on words. But what I was trying to tell people is, is that in any system, there is nothing is going to be organic like this, meaning because I say, okay, you know, the, in, if you're in a closed system like a Truman Show or a Hollywood backlot, everything from the jet stream to the underwater conveyor system, all that stuff is going to be mechanical in some nature, you know, whatever power, whatever you're using to power it, including the magma system. And what I'm saying here is I'm saying, yeah, volcanoes seem organic, but at the same time, you don't want it to be organic because one super volcano later and we're done. So you'd want to be, be able to control most of those systems. And 
you think I'm kidding, but at the same time, we know so little about actual geology. We only we know some surface stuff, fine, but I think the carbon dating system is completely full of crap. And you, we all have seen the pictures uh, in, in our classrooms of the cutaway cross-section of the globe. If you supposedly uh, dug down to the center of the Earth right now, it would take you 4,000 miles to get there, if you believe mainstream science. And yet, the deepest hole ever drilled and I'm not kidding when I say this, is not even 1% of that. 1% of the, w the way the center of the Earth is 40 miles, and the deepest hole ever drilled is 8. It's a fraction of 1%. So what exactly are those cross-sections? Uh, you know, they're not photographs, obviously. They're artist illustrations. Where did those come from? And geologists and science will say, well, you know, we're extrapolating, we're expanding. I'm going, no, you absolutely have no idea. But you, since you don't put a disclaimer on those drawings, you show a kid that at nine years old and then show it to him again when he's leaving school at 18, uh, he's going to believe it as gospel. So, you know, that's the, the, the dangers of mainstream science. They don't put the fine print everywhere like we have to do now with commercials, you know, where somebody's driving over the salt flats and they say, you know, professional driver on closed course. They should be required to do that on everything that they put out there that they don't know. Science hates saying that. They hate, for me, honestly, I would put in the middle of the globe, I would put a big question mark because you don't know. But science hates doing that. They don't like doing it. It's like, oh, we're going to make a leap of faith and we're not going to let anybody know that it's a leap of faith after a while. We're just going to let it slide. So, yeah, it's nice. Anyway. Okay. And another, another thing that puzzles me would be meteors for example on the moon there are craters it does appear that something has hit the surface of the moon mm -hmm. there's also falling stars and things like that that people witness sometimes people even even find meteors so if, if the earth is flat and there's a dome covering it how is mm -hmm. that that meteors and objects fall from space to the earth mm -hmm. good one first off when it comes to meteors we only have tracked the small ones yeah we've got evidence of the big ones but that could just be terraforming yeah the, the big one in arizona where they shot part of uh, the movie starman we, we all know that crater and the gulf of mexico is supposedly another big crater the only ones we've seen though since our civilization has been around and i'm not going to call the tunguska blast of 1908 a meteor since there's no evidence of it i mean yeah the trees were knocked over we know that much is the you know the small ones and that's not hard to, to do with an enclosed system you just take a, a piece of metal or at speed and uh shoot it into the atmosphere you know using i don't know rail gun and let it you know friction do its you know worst you know eventually hopefully detonate that thing and hopefully you do that and try not to aim at any major cities and it works really really well is it part of an automated system maybe could be manual don't know, but the rest of the stuff doesn't hit. You know, show me, you know, isn't interesting that all, you know, our 5,000 years, we haven't had a, a meteor strike even close to a civilization. Yeah, we've had, as far as I know, no no major population centers hit. And while, while you were mentioning the moon, also interesting that the moon craters are all hit at 90 degree angles. There's no skidding moon craters. They all look like they were fired in directly mm. perpendicular to the surface. And, you know, like it was decorated, like, like the moon was, you know, peppered with stuff while they were while they were building it or constructing it or drawing it, whatever you want to say. You'd think if a, if a meteor comes in at a shallow angle, it'd dig like you'd know, be scars, these deep trenches of varying uh, angles and trajectories. But no, it's it's the exact opposite. It's just these fully formed, big, huge, nicely, you know, circular craters. And it's in your opinion. The moon landing well i i share this opinion but the moon landing is completely fake you would hold that it was a, a hoax oh my god yes yeah no, the, moon, the moon landing the apollo that's the first thing you got to give up the americans going to the moon in the 1960s repeatedly without anybody dying is staggeringly unlikely and by that I mean, and I'll, I'll I, I know we don't, I know you probably have a few more questions. I don't know, but but uh, let me let me put do the 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 easy one. Here's the trap question, which I like to throw at people, and that is it's about the Van Allen radiation belts. You run into anybody in science or think they've got a scientific background, ask them this question: Are it's a really simple question. Are the Van Allen belts deadly? Yes or no. And the reason why it's a trap question is this: If they say 
yes, they are deadly, then you say, okay, then how did Apollo 8 through 17 do round trips through them? Nobody died, nobody got radiation poisoning, nobody got cancer. How, how, with no shielding. You can look up the specs, they are not secret on the capsules that went to the moon and back, supposedly. There's no radiation shielding at all. We, we all know what protects us from, from radiation, at least the metals department. I'm not counting water they use in reactors. The metals department, it's lead and it's gold, both very, very heavy. As a matter of fact, gold is twice as heavy as lead, and lead's heavy. So how, if, it's, if it's not deadly, how'd they get through it? And if they say, I'm sorry, if, if it's deadly, how'd they get through it? But if it's not deadly, then go to the NASA website and tell me why NASA won't send any manned probes out past 400 miles because they say Van Allen belts are deadly. And they say this in a little movie, you can find it anywhere, it's still on NASA.gov called Orion Trial by Fire. Where they, where they go into detail and they say, oh yeah, yo, it's deadly, we have to make round trips and we're not going to send any manned people through it first because we haven't figured out how to solve the radiation problem. Those it's it's a complete contradiction in what they said before it's like okay so you haven't solved the radiation problem now in 2017 but you did in 1960 we did we go backwards what, what exactly happened uh, you know i could i could literally spend an entire show tearing apart the moon missions but the the easy ones you want to look at the moon missions three three quick ones um the no stars fine you know they want to say camera exposure fine the 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 other ones would be intersecting shadows. If there's one light source from the moon, that's the sun. Shadows cannot intersect from the, they, they cannot run into each other because that means multiple light sources or a very small light source, which means a sound stage. And of course the blast crater. Look, you know, the, the a, a 10,000 pound uh, th or 10,000 thrust pound engine, pound thrust, pounds of thrust, pounds of thrust engine, blasting into what looks like volcanic ash, and there isn't even the hint of a blast crater. And you say, well, it doesn't mean anything. Oh, yeah, it does. I could go to the beach and blow on the sand, and that sand is more coarse than that ash on the moon, it supposedly is. I could blow on the sand, and I could make a, a, a crater just with the air from my breath. And this 10,000 pound thrust engine didn't generate anything? Come on, those, those things alone is enough to tear apart the moon mission. You've got to get rid of it. The Americans didn't go anywhere near the moon. They had to fake it because they didn't want, they wanted to make it to where they had to militarize space and they didn't want any private companies getting into it for the longest time, which is why only now SpaceX is coming out and they're not going anywhere. SpaceX, you know, as much as they say, oh, SpaceX is doing this and doing that. It's like you still have never even claimed to have sent a man to space. You say you're going to go this time next year. You're going to send two tourists around the moon and back. I'll bet a, everything I have that they're they're going to kick that one down the road. and They're not going anywhere. A another funny one is the Mars rover where there is apparently an incident where they caught a, a rat or a little rabbit or something. And it was mixed in there with the Mars soil. Oh yeah, the the Mars rover. Well, let's go into just the the technical side of it. Whereas, look, we all know if you know anything about cars, you know that a battery. Well, generally, in batteries, and just take a car battery. Car batteries have on there an expiration date, and by that it means when that battery finally dies, not when it charges and gets discharged and all this sort of stuff. When it finally dies, it's dead. That's it. That's why you take your battery in and exchange it for another battery. There's nothing they can do. It's 2017. Nothing they can do for your battery. That that technology has not changed for a hundred years. And that is once the battery is, you know, you you basically used up the the charging capacity of the metal. And yet this Mars rover, and I think it's going on nine years now. I think it was seven when I started talking about. It. I think it's nine now. That Mars rover battery should have been dead to the world a decade ago. And for some reason, it's still going. The Mars rover just miraculously just keeps going. It's 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 a miracle. It just keeps driving around, taking pictures and all this stuff. At one point, it was like shut down for a year. And they said, oh, we got this backup system to work. No, it didn't. You figured, you did some focus groups, figured the public would, would buy it. And that's why you did it. They get more funding. It's, it's just, it's incredible. But yeah, the, the pictures they're taking are going to be on Earth somewhere. Somewhere in a, a place where there's nobody up, probably in the northern uh, part of the northern hemisphere. You know, it's it's uh, it's awful, terrible.
one thing that I often get when I get into disagreements with people about flat earth is they say, oh, I went on a plane trip such and such years ago and I saw the earth's curve from the plane. They'll tell me stuff like that. Like if I was to go up in a plane, uh, maybe some kind of high altitude <clears throat> plane that I would be yeah. able to see it. But but that's not actually true. Is that correct? No, no, no. As a matter of fact, I've had people, and uh, anyone listening out there, I'll put the challenge to you. We're going on two years now. Anyone who thinks they can see the curve from the beach, I still have people that say they can see the curve from the beach. Beach or a plane or a balloon or a mountaintop, whatever it is, you take a picture of it, you put it on your computer, you hold some sort of straight edge up to it and tell me if the curve's still there. If it is, you can email me at msergeant23 at comcast.net and I will quit Flat Earth the second I get that picture. And to date, nobody has even sent a picture because it's it's not there you want here's the difference you want to see the curvature we're told it's very orwellian in a way you know there are five if you're told so we've seen focus groups you can do psychological lookups from this all day long focus this is it's it's um it's peer pressure whereas you're told for years and years and years that there's a curve you're told years and you know that there are five lights even though you see four but you're told there's five, eventually you're going to question yourself. You're told it's a curve. You're going to want to see the curve and nobody sees it. They want to see it. Some people have convinced themselves that it's there, but if you take a picture of it, it's not there. And then they get confused and frustrated. Same thing with pilots. Pilots, when they're up there, because they're in the cockpit, they see it, you know, a great panoramic view. They always see perfectly flat, but because they are told, you know, since you were children, that it's curved there's this weird paradox going on in their head it's like yeah we see flat in fact i've talked to pilots several of them have, have come forward and talked about this and say oh yeah we all know that we only see flat at any altitude up there and that's way better view than people seeing in the passenger seats but they you know they they, they can't but the thing is even the best navigator who are you going to tell if you're a pilot you can't tell anybody if even if you think the world is flat you might as well tell them that you were chased by a ufo it, it would probably in fact be easier to tell them that UFO, you'll probably just be benched. Uh, you tell them it's flat, you're probably going to get a psychological evaluation. Has anybody gotten seriously ticked off at you because of flat Earth theory? No, 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 no. Uh, it, because it sinks in fairly quickly. Once you start looking into flat Earth, you realize that it's the ultimate street magic trick. You fell for something that was around you the entire time but it wasn't again it wasn't your fault the it's the old pt barnum saying which is you can fool some of the people all the time and all of the people some of the time and that's really what we're talking about here you can't fool all of them forever but this was something that was big enough remember most of our population lives you know between sea level and one mile up so unless you have the ability to get to the outer marker, you know, deep into Antarctica, which is controlled by the government, or you have a plane that can go 100 miles or further, which nobody has, you know, that's all military, you sealed off the upper edge and the outer edge, no one's going to know the difference. In fact, most people don't know, even, even the powers to be, you know, and pilots don't know, scientists don't know, na most NASA employees don't know. Some of the telemetry guys, yeah, maybe. But this is some. This is a secret you really don't want to have a whole lot of people knowing because it weighs on them pretty heavy. It, it, a lot of people don't. I think they told the Apollo astronauts. I think they, they told them. But after that, they realized psychologically some people just can't take it. So every astronaut after that, they just you know made them sign a disclosure agreement and said, eh, you just aren't, you don't have enough clearance. It's above your pay grade. Okay, and... At this point, I would like to get into who the heck is behind this all? Who has this agenda where they want us to keep, to think that the Earth or believe that the Earth is round? In your opinion, Mark, who is behind this and why? Well, it's not us. I can, I can say that. It's an advanced civilization. The only thing we did was we kept it a secret. The initial secret was way beyond us, though, which meaning... It really depends what what angle you want to take here. You you could either say that it's divine, you know, intelligent design, or that God subcontracted out the work. It's because really, what we're talking about here is a civilization that's 
multiple octaves above us in terms of technology and had the ability to create basically a planetarium thousands of miles wide and probably thousands of miles high as well. And you think, well, it's way, it's way beyond anybody. It's like, really? Because we, you know, we can do this on a limited scale. We can do things now that we couldn't ex even explain to somebody 200 years ago. Seriously, if you, you know, don't forget that uh, heavier-than-air flight was literally deemed impossible by physicists only 100 years ago. So I don't believe anything's impossible. Now, we, our civilization had to cover it up, but that goes into the whole men hate giving up power thing, which is, you all remember the, the, the Truman Show movie from 1998 where you know Truman gets out to the edge and he starts banging on the edge and then what happens? The first chance, first door he sees, he is out of there, right? And think, well, yeah, of course. And how the movie was written, that was the only way it was going to go because he, he realized his marriage was a sham and his best friend was a sham and the whole town was a sham. The whole thing was a, was a big setup. It was a big stage. Well, what if it wasn't Jim Carrey that went out there? What if it was... What if there were more people? What if the whole town didn't know, for example? What if the mayor got out there in a boat and he found that it was the edge? Would he actually walk out the door? Because he's got a pretty good thing going. You know, he's mayor. He's got perks. He's got all sorts of fun stuff. You're going to give up the good life for, you know, you know, the devil you know versus the devil you don't know. And that's kind of what we're talking about here. It depends who finds out where you are. So, yeah, if you or I found the edge, yeah, we might try to, to, to go beyond it. Or we might go back and tell people. We don't have that much to lose. But if you're a government organization or a scientific organization... You have a lot to lose, especially a scientific organization that said, oh, yeah, it's a globe for the last 500 years. Well, you really going to go back on that? People say, well, no, I, you know, science would absolutely tell people. I'm going, well, in one sense, yes, it would benefit them because it'd be this great new scientific discovery. And whoever discovered it would make a lot of money and it'd be on the cover of all these magazines. But science as an institution could be potentially decimated by this because you're admitting the the foundation for a lot of other sciences is not so steady. You know, we're talking, you'd have to rebuild. I mean, think of what would happen, all the, the major academic institutions all over the place. Uh, astronomy and astrophysics, that's gone. Those things don't even come back anymore. They close their doors, that's it. The remaining ones, geology, hydrology, biology, archaeology, take your pick, doesn't really matter. Those have to be retooled literally from the ground up no play on words there at, for the new model all the textbooks have to be thrown out that takes time that takes effort and you've got to re-examine all these models education gets thrown into chaos and you really going to risk that if you're the scientific it's like shotgunning your own foot not a lot of people would do it even if it was for the right reasons you just you just don't want to do it and that's that's what we're talking about here the 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 powers that be it's a short meeting. It does. It's not like they had to hum and haw about it. They really. It was. It was an instinct reaction. It's like if the population even had the the chance to grab pitchforks and torches and come after science, they're not going to do it. So anyway, advanced. Short answer to that short. Advanced civilization built it. Science covered it up. Okay, and in terms of an advanced civilization mm -hmm. could it be the anunnaki that zechariah sitchin is most famous for pointing out could it be an ancient race of custodial aliens that gave their technology to mankind and now wish to keep us in some sort of game reserve sure or the anunnaki could have been part of you know they could be locked in here with us one of the two, you know, I mean, who's to say who the final, who, who's version one and who was put in here first and who, yeah, who are the custodians, who are the janitors, who are, yeah, it's very possible. Of course, I'm kind of, when it comes to Sitchin, I'm, I'm a little, because I've watched enough movies, I still think the guy ripped a lot off from When Worlds Collide. If anyone wants to go watch that movie and then take a look at Sitchin's work again, but it doesn't really matter because there are there are races out there that are far far older than us but i like to call them older versions than us you know they're they're just different versions of what we had you know the i believe you know let's face it there was a civil a civilization that had to be relocated to make room for us and when we you know we have to are asked to move on to a different place 
there'll be another one that'll follow us. So we are, we're just part of the chain. Okay, and how about the idea that there are a network of secret societies, Freemasons and other secret societies, as well as the global elite that are all working together and they are, they're called the Illuminati and they worship Lucifer. And could it be an Illuminati behind this or could it be Lucifer himself? Well, yes, potentially. I mean, there's a lot of different groups out there. Take your pick. Uh, Illuminati, Bilderberg, Rothschilds, Trilateral Commission, Count, um, uh, Council on Foreign Relations, the Masons. T take your pick. The, the Vatican. All sorts of groups. But what I believe is that even they didn't know for the longest time. Yeah, they probably had the old maps, sure. But you, let's say, again, you're the king of France in 1500. You have the old map that shows the, the flat world. What can you do with it? 1500, you got wooden ships and horses. You, you don't even have balloons. So what, 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 what good is that information to you? Until the internal combustion engine is made in 1900, and until you can get planes built, which really aren't the, the decent planes, aren't until 1930s, 1940s, until you can get that, what do you know for sure? Which is why they were so desperate to try to map this thing out. So I think even the great secret societies for, that have been around for a long, long time didn't know until the 1950s, until Admiral Byrd finally, during that last mission during, during Operation Deep Freeze, didn't know for sure. They, they had an inkling, but they couldn't exploit it until then. And then once the one towards the end of the 1950s, 1960s, that's when everything changed. Now, on that same topic, mm -hmm. could there be people that come from perhaps black ops or private funded organizations that are actually going out there spreading disinformation about flat earth and, and making ridiculous flat earth arguments in order to make the entire flat earth belief system look stupid. Well, if there are, I haven't really seen any yet because uh, and again, the community is broad covering a whole bunch of different demographics now. And I have yet to see anybody jump forward and just say, okay, here's, here's some really, really crazy. I mean, remember flat earth is, is crazy to begin with. Right? So even the, the stuff, the early stuff, like saying that gravity is just acceleration, that we're on a disc that's accelerating through a, a vast thing, and that's that gravity is that. Even that hasn't really stuck that well. The rest of it, though, I've, I've kept a, a pretty good finger on the pulse of everything that's been going on there, and nothing has really caught my eye as far as eccentric. And, and people say, well, no, quasi-luminous, he's, he's a pretty eccentric guy, going, yeah, but he was... He was making the cut up newspaper uh, hostage type <laughs> presentation stuff. He was doing that a long time before Flat Earth, so that's just him. And but I mean, the conference that we're doing in the fall, everybody there seems pretty pretty much on the same page, more or less. Yeah, according to Quasi Luminous, we should all band together and make a journey to the North Pole. North Pole, North yeah. Find the holy grail and we need to take our blood and spill it all over the ground I know. yeah that's about as fringe as it gets with with his stuff but again he was doing this stuff i remember kind of digging into a few of his things way before you know this started he's been around he's been doing he he's he's in he's been in that headspace for a long time before flat earth so uh, the fact you know in fact he's latching onto flat earth hey great and fine and everything He's got quite a few followers, but uh, but even he isn't derailing anything. You know, I don't get a lot of complaints saying, "Oh, you really should talk to Quasi Luminous." So, yeah, but you know, to each his own. And he's he's as long as he's not as long as it's constructive, as long as he doesn't have anybody killed, probably okay. Well, let's let's talk about his theories for a second. Uh, what about what about this idea that? Uh, there's actually a hole leading to hollow earth at the North Pole. Do you feel there's any possibility of that? Oh, sure. Sure. I was a hollow earth guy for a while and uh, hollow earth is very uh, dovetails quite well into this because remember most of the population we have now lives from sea level to one mile. It would not take much of a cavern to hold a civilization. In fact, if you want to get kind of spooky twilight zone type stuff, you could say, that let's say you had a cavern that was, I don't know, 200 miles high and 20,000 miles wide. 
it would look kind of like what we're in now. You know, if you had a decent projection system on the screen, who's to say that we're not inside a hollow earth? It's, it's very, very possible. So if there's an entrance up, the, up there, sure, why not? The, the two different stories, you know, Admiral Byrd, the 1926, that's how everyone remembers Admiral Byrd in the conspiracy world, at least the beginning of it, where he supposedly went into the hollow earth entrance and, and turned into like a journey to the center of the earth type thing with another civilization. But the other story that most people don't know, if you want to look into this fun stuff, look into uh, Charles Lindbergh. Charles Lindbergh supposedly was the second guy to do it and that he wanted to show pictures and because they wouldn't the government wouldn't let him and he was going to do it anyway and that's when the whole Lindbergh baby thing happened and he got so pissed off after it ended badly that he renounced his citizenship and left the United States which that part was true how do you feel about Eric Dubai do you feel that he is a good researcher he's a good researcher I just wish that, and I've said this on many things, I just wish his beliefs, his extra extracurricular beliefs uh, on demographics, his biases towards other demographics were kept out of it. That's all. I, the Flat Earth is the fear killer. Flat Earth is also the discrimination killer. If you have a bias towards a particular group, I don't care which one it is, and people know my utter hatred towards the Eskimos and the Himalayan Sherpas, <laughs> it, those groups have nothing to do with my flat earth beliefs and so I say look keep them separate if you can if you don't eventually you're going to run into problems so uh, just my message is the same as it always been just keep keep focused on flat earth and nothing else uh, okay um, what about you know, since we're talking about other theories uh, what about his theory that dinosaurs are fake do you buy into that at all well, it's a second tier conspiracy, like any of them, you know, when people will talk about, but I will say this, I doesn't surprise me. I, at the very least, the carbon dating system is completely screwed up and that would fit in with some sort of manufactured world, which is when you go from one civilization to the other, you're going to have these gaps and you know, whatever terraforming process is used. The carbon dating system is going to be screwed up but because scientists don't look at terraforming as an option they say well if it's a natural process it had to have occurred over this number of years and look we see fish uh, there's fish in the ocean right now that should not be there it should have died out millions of years ago uh, i still think the loch ness monster you know could be a plesiosaur but if you catch a plesiosaur that opens up a whole can of worms which i don't think science wants to deal with which is what's a plesiosaur doing in a lake when it should have died out millions of years ago? The only explanation that, that of course, works for me because it works into a uh, manufactured world is that, you know, some of these things were kind of left over as, you know, little bonus mysteries from one civilization to another. And that the earth isn't that old. The civilization, oh yeah, our civilization go back, go back 5,000 years. But the gaps in between our civilization and the previous ones, we have no idea how long they are. How about this idea that there were once a race of giant humans and possibly a hybrid race with these Anunnaki or maybe something entirely different? How about the idea that there have been giant skeletons found and it's all being covered up similar to Flat Earth? Sure. Why not? The, I mean, think of the, the technology we use today. You think, well, what does that have to do with that? I'm going, think of how big things used to be tube transistors the electronics that we used to start out with were monstrous uh you know the computers that would take up an entire room now can fit literally in the palm of your hand we have more processor power now and what happened was if i'm if you're old enough to remember things just got smaller and smaller and smaller the japanese were brilliant at it genius at it to where you know i mean remember the first transistor radios they kept making i mean honestly we have we can make uh, iPods now I've got like an iPod shuffle you know those little tiny ones that are about the size of a matchbook the only reason they aren't smaller is because then they become absolutely unusable we could make iPod shuffles that were literally tiny 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 but you'd never be able to work them with your fingers so to say that the early versions of this place had giants on them yeah why not and then you just start working in smaller and smaller and smaller why not you get more bang for your buck if you can design you know civilizations that are smaller you can you can fit more on a, an area i think it's the i think it's a natural process of terraforming 
a lot of a lot of people that are flat earthers earthers they believe that space is actually made up of either water or some type of liquid substance. Yeah. Uh, what do you think of that? Is it liquid? Is it a vacuum? What exactly is up there? Well, the barrier that separates, you know, the, the waters above and the waters below could be just about anything. You know, if we're living in, if, if the water we swim in is two parts hydrogen, one part oxygen, and the air we breathe is one part oxygen and four parts nitrogen, then the heavy thing that's up there above us, take your pick. Is it a heavy element? Is it heavy water? Is it frequency based? Is it electromagnetic in nature? We don't know. Is, is, is it artificial gravity? Is it, is it partially a unified field? Can't, can't say. Uh, but either way, there seem to be things suspended in it. So yeah, could could the stars be inside this thing? Yes. Is it a liquid you can drink? Eh, I don't know. Is it something we can punch into? Yeah, I don't know. Uh, but it's it's definitely something that we can't get out of, in my opinion. Okay, and this is something that you kind of alluded to earlier, but I have a specific thing I want to bring up. A lot of talk in there's a lot of talk in the conspiracy world about something called transhumanism or supposedly these hidden elite are trying to usher us into a technological future which would include leaving our physical bodies and existing in a virtual reality state. I find it very odd that something like that would be going on. Uh, could it be that we've actually always been in the simulation and they're just kind of using this transhumanism thing as a way to tell us what's really going on? Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. The um... Again, you don't have to look that far back in media. Of course, the, the most famous being the 1999 Matrix or 1998 or is it 99? I think it was 98. Uh, Truman Show or, but more, more, more to the point, the 13th Floor. The 13th Floor was a brilliant movie. And that movie was even a remake. That was based off of a German movie called World on a Wire back in the 1970s in German, and which was amazing, which is... Uh, in the 13th floor they made a virtual reality which they could jack into and then realize when they came back out of it that they would start questioning where they were and star trek next gen actually touched on that several times where the with the holodeck and that is if you made a hologram uh convincing enough you know you that you would blur the lines of reality which gets kind of tricky because and which is why I don't think you're going to be able to let ha, have to let it get that much farther than we are now, because then then it turns into again use another movie reaction then it turns into an, an inception you know the movie with uh, Leonardo DiCaprio type scenario where if you start blurring the lines then it takes the relevance of this world away, and I don't think the beings that built this place is going to let that happen. They let it happen, you know, we let it happen in the movies, let it happen in the 13th floor, let it happen in Inception. I don't think it's going to happen here, though. We're going to get close, but that, it's kind of, it's an indicator to me that we're coming to a conclusion. By the way, I've got about, uh, five or seven minutes left because I, I've got another, I got a show I got to do, but I just want to let you know in advance. Oh, yeah, of course. Thanks for that. Yeah. Uh, no why, don't, why don't we go ahead and use this opportunity? Uh, what I like to do at the end of each show is just open up the floor and Mark, here's an opportunity for you. If you want to get on the soapbox one more time, if you don't have time, that's fine. Or if you just like to uh, either just do some plugs or follow up with some plugs. Feel, oh, sure. Feel free to do that now. All right. Uh, let's see. Read my lips. No new taxes. That's my soapbox. The That's from George Bush, by the way. I know you're probably not old enough to remember. The uh, soapbox. No. What I'm trying to tell people is like, look, don't believe a single word I've said here tonight what you've been listening to because it's i'm not gonna be able to convince you in an hour and a half but what i will say is this if you're interested at all take a look don't dig into it real deep but do your own research and ask questions because it is the world you're living in is not what you think if you're a movie fan you already know what i'm talking about if you're a big television fan if you watch enough twilight zone or outer limits or any of those old shows you're going to know what i'm talking about the potential this is something that science fiction has has delved into for a number of decades and if you think it's beyond the realm of possibility let me throw this this out at you which is with all the great science fiction stories that have been written over the years all the fantastic works i mean there's been so many movies and books 
uh, and, and television shows written, wasn't it statistically likely that one of those was going to be right? And in this case, why, why not this story? You know, I mean, think of the movies we, we've seen out there that have been like this, like Dark City or The Truman Show or The Village by M. Night Shyamalan. So again, don't, don't close it off entirely. Open up your mind a little bit on this and see what you think. And if you try, or, you know, I'll just put the challenge. I'll end it on this. Uh, the challenge is this. Try to debunk it. Do what everybody else did. Try to shut it down. Say, you know what, Mark, in fact, you could, if you could email me your debunking argument and say, it's not flat, here's why, and you absolutely believe it 100%, yeah, I'll listen to you. But I bet that during the process of you writing that email to me, you're going to be sucked down the rabbit hole. And the only plug I'm going to give is the YouTube channel. Or in fact, if you want to see the entire community, the entire community's work, just type in Flat Earth into YouTube. You'll find it. There's a lot, a lot of stuff out there, not just mine. If you want to see my stuff, type in Flat Earth Clues, and you'll eventually get to my webpage, which is just my name. And good luck with the rabbit hole, because once you go down it, I don't think you're coming out. That's my that's my speech. All right, Mark. First of all, thanks for joining us today, and it was definitely very interesting. I'd sure as heck love to do this again some sometime in the future. Sure, be happy to do it. I, that's this is what I do all the time. Flat Earth, twenty four seven. <laughs> well, okay then. Until we reach that point, you have a good day, my friend. All right, you too. Have a good.